Hi, my name is Corinne Waldo. I'm the Senior Director for Economic Vitality at the Boulder Chamber. Thank you for joining us for the March 4th update uh, with Boulder County Public Health here in Boulder County. Your opportunity each week to ask questions, get updates, and learn what's going on with coronavirus in our area. Uh, we do have a couple um, changes that are happening this week, including one change for Five Star, and there, there is a vaccination change, which I did send out last week. Lane should be covering most of that today. So let's hand it over to Lane. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you all for joining. We're going to cover our current data that we've shared with you for the last several months. We're also going to talk a little bit about the dial status, but more so about vaccination phasing and uh, that we are projecting at least some cleanups to the, to the dial. Uh, cover a little bit on five star and then make sure to have plenty of time for your questions and answers. So we still are in yellow. We had been trending, started at the end of last week. We were, had moved into the blue for our case, our incident rates. Uh, but the last couple of days we popped right back across the, um, we were right at that border of the two blue and yellow and we've now kind of popped back across into yellow. So here's where we're at as of you know today, just loaded this up, but we're at 100.9. So 100 is the cutoff. So we're right at the border of that blue and yellow. And again, we, we've been in blue for several days, but now have popped back across into yellow. Don't think that this is a, a big trend. We're still down from where we were a week or so ago, we were about 110. So the trend is still continuing uh, in a favorable, just a very slow trend down. Still in blue for our positivity, which is great. Still wanna encourage people to get tested, but because that is still an important early detector to minimize spread of disease. So that is still important, but this is also trending down. It was 2.9% last week. So again, a good trend. Hospitalizations, uh, again, kind of has always hovered around this area that nine-ish or so days, and that's about where we were um, about this time last week. The, the big trend lines in cases, uh, again, continuing that downward trend, just would love for it to have dropped off like it did uh, in, in the steeper part where it dropped off. Now we're kind of in this very slow decline, but again, that's what we wanna see is a decline. Kind of looking around about 45 cases per day is kind of what our current trend is, um, which and we were at about 53 cases per day uh, last last Tuesday. So again, going in the right direction. You can see again as this is leveling off, um, still very similar trends across our municipalities of where our case breakdowns, and it's still very representative of where our populations live. So 38%. Uh, the case is so a little bit more skewed to Longmont because we have more people in Boulder, 30% uh, in, in the city of Boulder, but those are by far our two big populous areas. And then um, still seeing a little bit across the other municipalities and within uh, unincorporated county. And unfortunately, we're still, still seeing disparities across our, our people of color, especially our Hispanic Latinx communities. Um, slightly better maybe than where it was you know a week or so ago but uh but not still to where we want so again continued effort there's going to be continued uh, town halls on vaccine hesitancy there's a one coming up on march 8th that uh that our folks hosted by our uh, early child care folks so that's something that we'll try to get in Corinne's hands uh, so that that can be disseminated further so folks know more about that because that's another one of the barriers is, is hesitancy within that, that population. So again, doing well on our vaccines, uh, really close to 60,000 and probably are since this number was as of yesterday. So 60,000 residents vaccinated. So again, a good sign we continue to, to disseminate everything that we're getting. Uh, again, we've been past the, that 70% of 70 plus population for some time. We're over 85% actually for Boulder County. So that's good. Um, also moving into some of those other age groups, the 65 to 69. So over 50% of that population. And I think um, one of the other things that was really important, this is the metro area, 70 plus but uh, 
the metro area did get past that 70%. And as a state, very happy to see that the state population has now hit that 70%. So that's the big big metric for those five-star businesses. So again, as now that we've crossed back into yellow and not sure if we're gonna stay in yellow, that does and has allowed those businesses that were certified to move into the blue category for, for our five-star businesses. And again, not we were thinking that we might move as a county into blue, but that might be delayed still for some time. So for those five-star businesses, they already get to move into blue and have started this week. So again, just those takeaways, we, uh, we were in blue for five days, but unfortunately the last two days we uh, popped back into yellow. So we'll see where our trends go, but hopefully we can keep uh, moving back down and get into blue within the, for the case counts. Um, I've seen big increases in cases in our zero to 17. So um, both our young, young kiddos and school age kiddos. So that has been a, a challenge um, and it, that is, likely an artifact of schools having people back in person and then certainly we've seen the biggest driver within the schools has it been sports sports groups sports clubs um, have been the biggest driver for disease in schools so that continues to be a challenge um, and happy to see decreases in the 70 65 plus as well as the 18 to 22 year olds um, that persistent disparity still exists though in the hispanic latinx community um, doing again very well on our 70 plus population vaccination rates and um, again our testing numbers continue we st still doing quite a bit of testing as well as seeing low positivity. Uh, this does not include CU they are doing over 2000 tests just on campus a day and they have an, a very very low positivity rate so again that's also very encouraging and also consistent with what you know again seeing low low amounts of disease within that age demographic. Um, we have unfortunately seen some issues, public health order violations in, within the city of Boulder in, in the month of February. So that was a, a trend that we were not happy to see, but hopefully start to get that uh, back under control and uh, not see uh, big drivers of disease. So this is a link I wanted to make sure folks have because I've, I've gotten some slides uh, from the state, but there's a whole bunch more information. And this is really going to be your resource for questions you have about vaccines. Am I in this group? Am I in that group? We also will have provider lists with on our, our Boulder County website, but we won't likely be able to answer every person's question about which category you're in or who's gonna give you uh, your vaccine. You're gonna likely be working with your healthcare providers as we get into these uh, next few phases that I'm gonna talk about. So one B3, which is gonna be the next phase we're gonna be moving into starting tomorrow. And this is the listing of kind of who is in those, this 1B3 group. So agricultural workers, grocery workers, Coloradans 60 years and older, and then Coloradans that are between 16 and 59 with two or more comorbidities. Comorbid and so that is described here. It's probably too small for you to see, but as this gets sent out, um, and you go to that website, you'll be able to, to dig into that a lot more of kind of what underlying health conditions would constitute a co comorbidity. So this across the state is just under a million people. So a fairly big phase to, to get through. Um, and you can kind of see the rough breakdowns across the, the various groups within this 1B3. And then I th think beyond the fact grocery store workers and potentially agricultural workers. This next phase, 1B4, is probably the one that uh, many of you that have been joining calls uh, will be interested in, because this is an incredibly big phase that, that encompasses uh, a whole host of folks. So this is people age 50 and older, um, higher education faculty and staff that are student facing, frontline essential workers in food and restaurant services, frontline essential workers in manufacturing, frontline essential workers for the US Postal Service, frontline essential workers in public transit and specialized transportation, frontline essential workers in public health, frontline essential human services workers, faith leaders, frontline essential direct care providers for Coloradans experiencing homelessness, frontline essential journalists, continuity of local government, 
continuity of operations for state government, adults who received a placebo during the COVID-19 vaccination clinical trial, and then people 16 to 49 with one of the following high-risk conditions. And again, that information is all on that state website. So a whole lot of folks listed in these groups. This is the rough breakdown of who falls in those groups. And as you can see statewide, we're looking at 2.5 million people in this phase. So an incredibly huge phase to get through. Actually, the, the one before it is very large, but this one's even bigger. So a whole lot of folks will start to get triggered in these next couple phases. And the, the key need there, like we've talked about for much time is making sure the vaccine supply can keep up with the demand and the number of folks that are in these groups. This is again the rough timeline of when these phases are expected to start, the ones that have already that are already underway. Again, we're very, very nearly through our 1B1 um, and 1B2 is, is far along. Um, again, for at least for the, the 65 to 69 was already over 50%. But the phase 1B3, which is going to start tomorrow, a lot of folks, and then even more in that 1B4, which is estimated to start at the uh, end of March. And just again, to give those resources, that vaccine hotline, which is going to be an important one for people who have a lot of questions about are they eligible or not. And then that's the, the website URL for more information on the vaccines. All right, the other thing that we are expecting either today or tomorrow is an update to the public health order. From what we understand, it is largely gonna focus on cleanup, a lot of the different things the state has put out in guidance that it didn't get into the public health order are gonna be added into the order to officially make them part of the order. So we aren't expecting significant changes or shifts. This is things like the change in distance from performers to the audience when they're masked, um, changes of distance of the audience to sports competitions, those kind of cleanups that we've uh, been sharing for, for the last several weeks. And then we can jump into a five star. Um, I'll just give the data that was shared with us and Corinne, feel free to jump in. Uh, that I believe we're at 44 certified businesses, uh, 57 total audits. So some that are still in the queue as far as getting their approvals finalized and, um, and still zero complaints. So that was a great number. Hopefully we'll stay at that, that number um, actually. Corinne, anything else you wanted to share on Five Star? And just in case people didn't hear, because uh, because we hit that 70% of 70 plus for the state, as of yesterday morning, all five-star businesses can operate in blue. Uh, we understand that some of the capacity increases don't really change your capacities because of the size of your facilities. Um, some of the restaurants, for example, 50% is where you're where you're at. It's not going to actually increase, but it does in, it does make the um, last call 12 o'clock. So a five-star business can um, have last call at 12 a.m. Uh, in addition, it is a big change for some of our gyms, especially our larger gyms. So you go from 50 to 175 per room um, maximum, and then it's, and it's a percentage. So please note that um, the five-star certification is providing some benefits to those businesses that are certified um, and were, were the first in the county to be able to go to blue. <clears throat> There is a question already in that was about, well, if the county goes to blue, when can we operate in green? And actually under the new public health order, uh, the new dial 2.0, they eliminated the option for five-star businesses to operate in green um, when the county goes to blue. But there is a coalition of the five-star certified counties and municipalities around the state that are meeting to try to get some more benefits to five, for five-star businesses. Um, even as we move to blue. So stay tuned, we're working on making sure that this continues to show, um, to show you, to show the public, to show you, to provide you benefits because you've gone above and beyond um, on some of the um, public health um, orders. And I have to say, I just wanted to point out, I've been visiting some of the five-star businesses around the county just to pop in, go to a restaurant, go to this gym, talk to some 
And I, I'm pretty impressed with some of the measures that our businesses are going through to protect the public and protect their employees. And I'm happy that we have no complaints or violations that have been reported to the state. Um, and I hope to continue to show how, um, how wonderful our businesses are doing um, in protecting and following the, the orders, especially our five-star businesses. So. Thanks, Corinne. We've also been sharing this, but in case you hadn't joined a, a previous webinar, uh, a, a really valuable exposure notification system that you can get uh, on your phone. Download that app at that, at going to that uh, website to get it. And it's a very useful tool to help quickly identify potential quarantine and, uh, and avoid really spreading more disease. This is our continuing schedule. We, uh, you, we're doing the one o'clock session now, so you found that. And then we do not have anything scheduled for tomorrow, uh, our reserve time in case we have any major changes or issues within any sectors. But uh, as of right now, things are, have been fairly stable. Uh, again, we'll see if we get any major changes that we weren't anticipating in the public health order that comes out. But, the big change that we are expecting is probably in April, where there's likely going to be a big shift to the dial. So we certainly will make sure to cover that in our general session and likely have a, a very special session for that too, uh, once we get more details on that. And then we have our Spanish session, which has already been recorded and should be released today. And this is our contact information for our business team and the call center's number and, and operation hours. So if you need uh, general questions to, for the call center or if there's issues that you need to share with our business team, uh, that's our email. And we are ready for a question and answer. Great, we have a couple of vaccine questions. So we understand that 1B4 will now include, um, let's just start with the essential manufacturing, um, frontline essential manufacturing. What documentation do you, do manufacturers need to do for their employees so that they can receive vaccination so they can start preparing now to provide that, that documentation? I don't have an answer for that question. I know in the smaller groups, like when working with the school districts, um, really the school districts had providers that they had paired up with. So it wasn't a matter of bringing a lot of documentation. They were, they were scheduled into appointments. So, I don't know what will be needed to schedule an appointment with your provider, potentially just a letter from the, from the um, manufacturer saying that you are an essential worker for this uh, manufacturing business, but I'm not sure at this point. I'm going to put into the chat the link to the state provider list. Um, this will also lead to the next question that we have, which was around which was around um, how does a large, for example, manufacturer maybe get an on-site vaccine clinic? And they were talking about how their flu vaccine provider would be willing to do it, but they're not currently getting any of the vaccine. So maybe you can answer that. And then I'll put into the chat, the state's list of vaccine providers are their vaccine provider page, which also has the provider enrollment um, procedure as well. Yeah, I've, you know, I've had similar requests where people are interested in trying to host a vaccine clinic, um, you know, faith-based community, as well as just other larger settings. So I am sharing that with our vaccine team, but, um, you know, it may be something where you can reach out to providers to see if they are willing to come do a clinic at your site. Um, we will definitely not be able to organize all the clinics or organize all the vaccine efforts for all the different businesses that are going to qualify for these things. So, um, but I'm not sure about providers, you know, if that's something that they are going to be able to do. There's going to be potentially some larger state run clinics as we head into these base uh, phases. So we will share those. Um, they are going to likely be more focused on hitting some of the disparate populations, folks that don't have access to, to all the different networks that they that some of the other uh, community members do. But, uh, but as we get more information, we'll definitely share that. And speaking of those, in the governor's press, press conference, he mentioned those six pods that they'll be set, setting up around the state. And there was also an emphasis on the restaurant work, the restaurant frontline 
restaurant and food workers that come out in 1B4. I have to keep remembering what, what stage it is. Uh, in one before that will help with a lot of the smaller, um, you know, the restaurants to be able to send their employees to those pods that will be around the state. So those once in once we have more information around those, we will send it out. I've you know take the school districts for example. They were able to organize with a provider flu or shot clinics. Um, so that provider list is probably one, and maybe even your health care provider is a provider of the vaccine that you can organize a clinic with may not be at your facility but it may be at another facility where your employees can all go or sign up to go um, just like some of the smaller schools or the school districts or some of the other employers have done around the um, around the state so again i put into the chat vaccine providers page um, boulder county's also has a page but this links to boulder county's page as well it is, in addition, it has the information on how someone becomes a provider. Um, so if, for example, in this question, the person who provides your flu shots, if they're not getting vaccine yet, they may not have filled out the provider information and become a certified provider at the state, correct? That's possible, but there are an, a whole host of providers that are set up that just aren't also getting vaccine just because of such a limited amount that we are receiving. So again, our hope is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is approved and starting to be disseminated. There's already been some arrival and the CU has received some Johnson & Johnson. So that hopefully we're gonna see increased supply of vaccine coming into the county. So that's really the hope. Um, but uh, it, it is important for folks to, to think about, you know, checking in with your provider on how they may be doing things so that you have good information. Some some of the benefits and then also downsides of a whole business setting up a clinic for all your folks at the same time. That's great. We certainly do want to see everybody get vaccinated. Um, everybody getting vaccinated on the same day. The only downside is, you know, some people experience, you know, feeling very sore arms and, and you know, not feeling so great for a day or so. So having your entire workforce not feeling great for a whole day, you know, depending on what you do as a manufacturer, if you can afford to have people with really sore arms working in your business. Um, sometimes staging that is still to your advantage too. Yeah, my husband's school, they did it on Saturdays so that they had it two days. He was he was a little uh, off for the two days following his vaccine, but he's had both shots now. <laughs> uh, just lastly on the, I'm just making sure there's no more vaccine questions right now. If they want to offer to be a provider of the vaccine, uh, or sorry, offer to be a location for providers to to give the vaccine, where should they reach out? Just like you know, hosting a blood drive or hosting um, those types of things. Yeah, I don't know that there is a registration for for doing that, um, and I don't know that our vaccine team has a. Uh, has sort of a request line for that. I will look into that and if I can find something, I'll share it with, with Corinne to, to send out to folks. Well, on this particular um, business is a five-star certified space. So they have a little bit more ability to bring in some additional people into their space. Okay, so let's go into some recreation questions. Uh, are drop-in sports at rec centers still falling under the personal gathering guidelines and not organized sports such as pickleball, basketball, volleyball, um, drop-in meaning no cohort teams, but pickup games and under yellow, you're still limited to two families. Is, is that still the case? Yeah. Okay. All right, are pools still limited to two lap swimmers per lane? Yes. We know when swim lessons will be off, will be able to be offered as instructor led with the swim instructor in their water, providing the water physical support, the hands-on support with the, um, with the student. There's talk of some private swim schools that are allowing it um, in the county, but a lot of our, a lot of the people that are on these calls um, have asked this question a couple times as to whether this is allowed and when it will be allowed. Yeah, I know we've seen this question multiple times and I don't think the answer has changed at all. So under the current dial, short of being in green, that would be the only where, where 
I could see that possibly happening. Um, potentially if the swim instructors are vaccinated and we're in green, those might be conditions that would allow this. But right now under, under the COVID dial, this, this would still not be allowed um, unless again, they're from the same household. And how do we address the fact that they're noticing some private swim schools? Cause this has come up before allowing this type of instructor led support. Is there anything that needs to be done? You can share that with our COVID business team. You know, we do follow up on complaints, um, but that would not be something that would be consistent with the, what's allowed under the public health order. Okay. Again, unless they're from the same household. So, but unlikely that all this people are from the same household. All right, does the change down to 12 feet between performers and the audience require the performers to be masked at all times, like singers and- it does. And, and it, instrument players? It does. If they're unmasked, it's still back to the 25 feet. And that applies to the performers. So the performers would need to be 25 feet away if, if one of the performers is unmasked. And when we talk about performers, are we talking about someone standing at a podium giving a speech? Or are we talking about someone who's projecting a little bit more? It, it includes it people includes at a podium giving speeches? Yeah. What guidelines are recommended for use of outdoor spray pads when opening them up this summer? Um, you're going to need to maintain social distancing so that, you know, in my experience from when my kids were a little bit younger and like to go in there, that is kind of a free for all. So um, that that's kind of the key is other than same household, you know, people are going to have to socially distance. So. So. X's cutting off certain, you know, maybe some of the, I don't know. Yeah, if it's not really a, a station with lifeguards, if this is just a general area, like, you know, the, the spray pad and on Pearl Street in downtown Boulder, that's not manned or, or operated, you know, those, those are going to likely be a, a challenge to, if you're just, if you're inviting people to come to it, it's going to be unlikely that they will be able to keep their kids socially distanced. And as we showed earlier in the slides, our zero to 17 population is seeing the, you know, some of the biggest spikes in disease right now. So I know it's, it's hard and that's a fun activity as it gets warmer, but I would just say stay tuned because we're not likely going to see those open until maybe the earliest would be end of May, beginning of June. So hopefully things are radically different in three months time. So, you know, that would be a good one for us to come back to as we get further along. Uh, and we see the new dial changes and we see new, some of the vaccination rates and yeah, see where we we're at as a community and that could be a different answer. So um, hopefully that, that we'll see a lot, a lot different situation by, by June. Okay. It's an interesting, I mean, we're every day we're faced with, well, what if it's in this? I mean, I was visiting some of the five-star businesses and some of the creativity that they had to do in order to operate in red or, you know, if you're a gym and you're 30,000 square feet and you can only have 10 people in, but you have a basketball court too that's closed off, moving some weights in there. I mean, just some of the creative things that I've seen, um, hopefully as we move along, we'll be able to come up and strategize on some of those creativity or if it's not possible, just see where we are. Yeah. All right. Um, this, this is a question we get a lot and this is back to vaccines. Um, our massage therapist, when our massage therapist is going to be eligible, they have close contact. This is any personal services. Currently, they're not called out in 1B3. They're not called out in 1B4. So what is, what's the talk around personal services? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, that means they're likely going to be falling into, into phase two. Um, so, but because it's very specific of who's in which phase and, and it's been a challenge. It's unfortunately been a moving target. And, um, and it's pretty strict on who falls into, into which phase. So, and, and I know it's unfortunate that not everybody's there. And that industry certainly has high risk given that they are likely in contact with people for more than 15 minutes within six feet. So um, really it just comes back to being very, very good about screening for illness among your patrons and, you know, ideally having uh, high, higher level uh, protection beyond just a, a face covering, getting into more respirator even type protection. 
making sure you have some of the best, you know, not just maybe making sure you have, you know, better the face, better face covering. Sometimes they're using face shields, they're using the gloves, so forth um, within that industry. But currently, and we get this question in retail too, even essential retail, retail and, um, and personal services are not called out in any of the vaccination stages. Another question I'm getting, and this is, uh, you know, even though employers aren't necessarily in that next phase where they may not be in one, they might be in one before, should they provide the information on the stages to their employees? Because their employees may be over a certain age or have two comorbidities. Um, what, what are some best practices in that area? Yeah, I think those resources that I shared earlier, that, that state website, and it should have um, the phasing and, and obviously Corinne will, will share the link to this recording. So those are all important things to, to let people know because you're right. I think your employees may qualify in, into various different levels that might be ahead of where their occupation triggers. So um, you may not have any idea of their underlying health conditions and they may they may qualify to to get into a, a sooner phase. So and they probably will can work with their healthcare provider to say, oh wait, I have two of these conditions. Yeah. I'm on this, or I'm above sixty, or in the next phase, even if you know your retail or personal services, but you're over fifty, that's in the next phase, and it's now one comorbidity at that one at that phase too. So, one thing I'm telling employers is, you know, provide the information to your employees because they they may qualify sooner, and just provide them the links to the places where they the providers that they may be able to sign up for it with. Yeah, and I would I would expect anybody that's qualifying for comorbidities is going to be getting their vaccine through their health care provider. So it won't be just general clinics at work or other things like that. So yeah. Yeah, I've heard, you know, they didn't even think to go to their doctor and talk about it. So that's that that might help trigger that idea that I need to go talk to my doctor about the vaccine because I fit into this category. All right, so we have a business that's five-star certified and wondering in the category of group sports and camps, if that would include museum summer camps and whether, you know, those types of camps as well. Yeah, I would, I would expect that it would. And, and it asks about those capacities being indoor and outdoor. Now, the five-star right now is indoor certification. Um, we're working on some outdoor, you know, checklist type items, um, but I think they, they should follow the camp guidance in that way, right? Yeah, but I think it, I would expect if they've met all the criteria that as, as outdoor has um, more capacity than indoor and then blue to yellow, there's additional capacity increases there um, that they would likely be able to, to operate in the outdoor blue categories, so. And the one thing that we're working on with the state our outdoor event facilities, because right now it is not called out in the five-star certification. And we're working on trying to get a checklist or some information on that. They did, as of yesterday, create a new checklist for indoor really large facilities. I don't think we have any in Boulder County that actually can hold this many people, but they, they are making changes to the five-star checklist and adding them. So we're hoping the next one is that outdoor events. Gotten quite a few questions about that. All right, this is a technical question. Someone's son um, had a close contact on Friday with someone who later tested positive for COVID. Uh, his school emailed and has them quarant him quarantining for 14 days, but he had a but he had a positive PCR test on January 10th. So he's been put in quarantine, but he's in within that 90 day window of having it, had it previously. Can he go back to school and sports practices? Um, I think that would be a, a question that needs to go to our epi team. Um, I'm not sure if they were still requiring quarantine, if it's within 90 days or not. So I don't have an answer for that one. So maybe this person should, you know, this is one of those, those, you know, technicality quarantine questions should email the COVID biz at bouldercounty.org uh, web, you know, email yeah. address and you can and forward that can, on to epi. Yeah, and we can forward it on um, so that it would be important to know the exact test to make sure it was a PCR versus an antibody. Um, you know, those are different tests that tell different things. So to know when the person really was ill 
and that now that they should hopefully have some level of immunity. Um, also, what strain, if anything, was identified? Is this is it a new strain that we're concerned about? Because in those cases, there's that if this person was exposed to a new strain, they're often still quarantining folks. So, um, so there's a lot of nuances that need to be uncovered on that. Okay, so the best solution is to email covidbiz at bouldercounty.org and you can forward that on. We're not going to answer it on today's call, but those are the examples of questions where, you know, those are some of those technicalities that need to, you know, be forwarded on to the correct person to answer it. Any other questions out there, Q&A or in the chat? So we had, you and I had one yesterday and this is from a gym, uh, you know, someone tested positive that had been in the gym five or six days earlier and called and said, I had tested positive. What actions do they need to take? Um, really, th that's really going to look at if the person hadn't been in the gym for over five days and then they became ill, you know, I think in this case, it was at least three, if not five days later, and then tested and found out they were positive, they would not have been symptomatic at the time they were in the gym. So they couldn't have been contagious to make other folks sick. So in that case, there really wouldn't have been any exposures, even if the person had been, you know, or but they, there was no exposures. But even if the person had been sick when they were in the gym, you would go back and look, was anybody, you know, within six feet for more than 15 minutes? Um, and in the case, again, this gym has good protocols. So people are not, there, everyone is socially distanced. Um, so there likely wouldn't have been an exposure even if that person, it, it had been, you know, the next day. So, so that's why it is so important for gyms and others to make sure you're maintaining social distancing, that people are wearing masks, um, that you're doing frequent cleaning. So, which this gym was doing as well. So I think uh, in that case, there's really no additional action. They don't need to call all the people who are at the gym, but these are the reasons why you keep lists of who's at your gym. So in case there was an exposure, you can quickly identify and share that with contact tracers so they can notify all the other folks that, um, that they potentially are a high risk exposure. Um, but again, all the layers of defense. So the gym having good protocols prevents there really being any high risk exposures. But in this case, the person got sick, you know, after they had been at the gym, so. And we had an example last week, and I think the person's on the call today of, um, you know, a museum or a retailer where someone came in and they were sick, but they, they again, kept social distancing, fact, practice all the protocols. They were, they tested positive pretty soon after coming in, but because they had practiced all, the, all those protocols, they probably didn't need to contact everybody that was there. And in this case, the facility went and looked at video footage just to make sure and also extra clean the bathrooms or anything that was touched by the, by the person. But um, this is an example. So we had the gym example, we have museum, retail. So practicing those, those orders and those details and those practices will help protect your other guests, your employees, and from having to do anything extra if you get that call. I mean, I think that the reality that both of these places found out someone was sick is unusual. You're gonna not typically find out somebody was sick and they were in your place and they actually reach out to you to share that information, which is why you need to do these protocols all the time and assume that at some point, someone's gonna come into your business and they're gonna be sick but if you've done all these other steps, you really have minimized, you know, potential for anybody else to get that exposure. So, um, so these, these steps do work and help prevent the spread of disease. That being said, sick individuals really need to make sure that they're isolating. And that's why it's so important that they not go out and interact in all these various settings because um, when they are contagious, you know, they are going to be a high risk to other folks. And if you've been exposed and you have a and you have a um, test pending, should you be going out? Like I, yeah, that was another weird thing that came to me when I when I heard some of these stories. If you're if you're a high risk exposure, you should start to quarantine until you've gotten you know testing. Um, and actually, you still can't test out of quarantine. So even if you've got a test, you shouldn't be doing that you know day one because you still could become sick. Um, quite a bit of time later, so. All right, any last questions? We'll do a last call on questions. 
when that new public health order gets released, as I normally do, I will send the recording to this. I'll send the Spanish recording and I will send the new public health order and the changes. I do like to highlight the changes to the order in the actual email so that you don't have to go and comb them. Um, and they're, they've been pretty good lately of actually highlighting those changes when they release the order. So hopefully they'll continue to do that. We will we'll send that out. Uh, tomorrow opens 1B3. So if you fit into those categories, that is the next vaccination stage. The governor has said, doesn't mean you're getting the vaccination tomorrow. Tomorrow is when you can start getting on lists. So be patient. Uh, I know they're getting Johnson and Johnson this week, but they're not going to get it for the next two weeks. And then the numbers are supposed to go up. So uh, be patient. It just means that they will start. They will start being allowed to be on lists, but it may be three to four weeks before you get that vaccination. So that's one message that he gave over and over and over again in the press conference. Look, you know, we're, we're getting people on lists, but we doesn't necessarily mean that that's the day that they'll get their vaccination. Thank you, Lane. Thank you for continually um, providing this input, these answering these questions and being with us every week. We'll see everybody next week. Thank you.